can turn biofuels out of algae, and we can turn uh, garbage into electricity and all kinds of cool stuff, but it doesn't really prepare you for entrepreneurship. And I'll give you a classic example. When, uh, when, I, when I left the Air Force after a long career of doing some pretty cool stuff with this black box budget that Congress didn't appropriate, um, I learned pretty quickly that transitioning from a scientist to an engineer um, wasn't really a smooth road. And I remember having an opportunity to talk with an investor about this technology that we had developed. And the conversation went something like this. So the investor is like, well, you know, tell me what it is that you do. And I said, well, I take polymers, and through an exothermic reaction, I increase the stoichiometry of the syngas, and therefore exponentially increase the calorific value, exceeding 21 gigajoules per ton. And the investor is like, you know, who would want that, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, everybody, you know? And they're like, why would somebody want that? And I'm like, because I take polymers through an exothermic reaction and increase the stoichiometry. And there was a huge disconnect between me and the investor. And the investor finally says, well, how do I make money with this technology? And I say, by selling lots of these, you know? And they were, it was pretty clear that, that he and I just weren't communicating. But, you know, as, as every entrepreneur, we go through this cycle. And I, I'm originally from New York, where we have a little bit more of a, an entrepreneurial ecosystem. Here in Pensacola, it's a little bit more challenging. It's getting easier through lots of different uh, channels. But being an entrepreneur in Pensacola has its own set of challenges because you, you, your message, your, 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 you need to be more concise even your elevator pitch, you know, the tallest building in downtown is 11 floors, so you probably got like 13 <laughs> seconds to hone in your elevator pitch. So, like all companies, this is kind of how the company got started, you know, wearing lots of different hats. Uh, it gets a little easier, so this would have been maybe 20, 2016, yeah, because I was employee of the year that year as well. But this is how all companies start, right? Until you can convince somebody else that you got something. So now it's a little easier. We brought on some talent. And I always say, you know, being an entrepreneur and, and starting a company is a lot like building an airplane while you're flying it. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, Joe leaves Siemens, big company. Uh, Bernie leaves IBM, big company. And all of a sudden, you're flying this plane, you're looking around, and there's some crazy people enough to get on the plane with you, and there's no parachutes, and you're at 10,000 feet, and you're like, holy crap, I, I better make this work. So fortunately, I've done a lot in this specific space over my career. We, we did all kinds of stuff with the airports, just really, really groundbreaking stuff, pulled patents. We were doing electric autonomous vehicles 10 years ago. We were taking algae and extracting triglycerides and making biofuels and, again, plasma gasification where we took garbage and we subjected it to the intense heat of plasma, which is the fourth state of matter, and uh, we converted it into electricity. It, it powered the facility and then it put export, exported about a half a megawatt of energy back on the grid. Really cool stuff, groundbreaking research. Um, New York Times, uh, Washington Post. We had foreign heads of state come through uh, Hurlburt Field. I was the, uh, the lead scientist on the project at uh, uh, Air Force Special Operations Command. So we got to do some really, really cool stuff. So for me, you know, my story starts here. Um, I am an unapologetic, card-carrying tree hugger, so I don't make any uh, excuses for that because I'm smart enough to understand that this is what sustains us, right? All the air that we you know, take in, the food, the nutrients, the water. So we really need to do a better job of protecting the ecosystem that we live in. So for me, my mortal enemy in life are landfills. Landfills are very effective at polluting the air, the land, and the water simultaneously. And what you don't see is underneath all of the stuff you decided to throw away last night is this membrane, which is what protects your drinking water. 
So the manufacturer offers a five-year warranty on this liner. So that means that this particular uh, mixture of chemicals is designed to last for five years and one day. So what happens is, as we're putting all of these things in our garbage, and I have another conversation that talks about how our garbage has evolved over the last uh, 30 years. There's plastics in here, there's pharmaceutical waste, there's pesticides, there's um, heavy metals from electronics. You know, people don't repair things anymore, they just throw them out and they buy a new one. And what happens is every day, the landfill, like the one here or like the one across the country, there's 3,300 of them, they get compacted to make space for whatever you throw out tomorrow. And what happens is that liner gets punctured and this toxic mixture of chemicals is going down into the drinking water and creating problems for our grandchildren. So there's a better way to manage waste. If you think about any other sector, any sector, medicine, transportation, technology, uh, any other sector has evolved to the point that robots are performing surgery. We have electric cars in space right now. You know, we have a tiny computer with all of human knowledge at a fingertip, yet we spend our time arguing about politics as strangers. It's kind of weird. But um, the point is, we handle garbage the same way the Mesopotamians did. We dig a hole in the ground, we stick our garbage in it. And when it gets full, we get very innovative, and we come over here, and we dig another hole in the ground, and we put more garbage in it. So I look at this, because at the end of the day, scientists and engineers, we solve problems. So I look at this as, how can we convert some of this material into something useful, something beneficial that gives back to society, instead of just this disposable society that we've become. And we can recycle, but the problem with recycling is there has to be a market. There has to be an end user that wants to buy that recycled product. So if your company has an active recycling program, that's great. But if you're not committed to buying recycled products, if you don't have a green procurement program, you're not completing that cycle. So what happens is when the economy falls out, of this market, and it did earlier this year, uh, communities, unlike, um, just like ours, we start putting this material in the landfill because there's no market. Nobody wants to buy it. And what happened is totally out of our control, China, which was the world's recycling bin, if you have a plastic bottle, last year, this time last year, there was a 90% chance that that plastic bottle ended up on a slow boat to China and uh, it, it went into the economy of China. Well, that door has been shut. So we used to be at a 30% recycling rate. About half of that material is now going back into the landfill because there's no market, nobody wants to buy it. So I always say, if you want something dirt cheap, start with dirt. So we looked at how can we take garbage, which has a calorific value, which means there's energy density in that waste stream, and turn it into something that we can use. So through a partnership with the US Army Corps of Engineers, uh, we did a, what's called a CRADA, a Cooperative Research and Development Agreement, and we looked at um, how can we take that biomass and convert it into a solid fuel that can now displace the burning of fossil fuels. So the idea was we eliminate the pollution associated with landfills, and we eliminate the pollution associated with burning of fossil fuels. Well, so how do we do that? Well, it's pretty easy, I'm glad you asked. So we develop a technology that is sensor-based, so materials can be pulled out of the waste stream depending on what it is we wanna pull out, metals and, and uh, you know, things like that. There's still a value for that. A lot of the metals that get recycled here go to Alabama. And um, we can convert about 70% of what goes in into this fuel product. Well, so what do we do with the fuel product? Well, first we gotta make sure that it's safe. You know, scientists aren't quick to market. Um, you know, 50 years ago, the, there was a new insulation product that was supposed to be the best thing we had ever seen and people were rushing to put it in buildings. And then now we're pulling asbestos out of these buildings. So scientists are cautious and engineers are careful and then the, the attorneys make sure that everything is ready for market. So through an extensive uh, certification process, 
with engineering reports, um, letters of acceptance from the Florida Department of Environmental Protection, all of these things, we can now sell this fuel product. And here's what's exciting. I know you can't see it back there, so you have to take my word for it. But this letter here, uh, we have a project in Canada where a cement company is displacing 40% of their coal with this engineered fuel product. So here's what's interesting. Because typically when you think green, you think, oh, it's more expensive. You want organic bananas, eh, they're going to cost more. So this fuel buyer, which is the third largest cement company in the world, what this report basically says is they've displaced their carbon emissions by 22%, and they saved $2.5 million doing it. So it's a good news story all the way around. So what I want to focus my, my time on is a project that we're hoping to do here locally. Part of the reason that I got attracted to Florida was, uh, to Pensacola was probably not the reason that brought you here. We have a lot of super fun sites. We have a lot of polluted sites. And that's what you know, brought me here because we're going to fix this. So this site on North Palafox is uh, what we call the Escambia Wood Treating Site. Is anybody familiar with this? Have you seen it? You drove by it, probably didn't even know it was there. But there's a lot of pollution that has since been remediated. So our idea is to transform this site and create kind of a, an energy ecosystem. But not just any kind of development. We're creating what we call an ecological park. And what that means is one company's waste product, their output, becomes another, per, another company's input, becomes their feedstock. So now all of a sudden we have this um, uh, a circular economy that's happening. So the site becomes a zero discharge site where waste is used into something else. So that means we get real specific on who we want to recruit for this particular development. So I'm going to take maybe two more minutes. I know I'm over time, but I want to show a video because I think that probably um, talks a little bit more about what we want to do. But this component is something that is important to me. Um, I have two small kids. I have a six-year-old and a four-year-old. And I, I believe all kids are scientists, you know. My six-year-old challenges the laws of gravity every day. And uh, my four-year-old's recent experiments in fluid dynamics has caused her to go back into a sippy cup. Um, so kids need an outlet. Because unfortunately, the way our educational system is structured, we teach to the test. And creativity and curiosity and imagination are stifled. So this could become an opportunity where kids can be kids. So I want to take two more minutes and just play this video for you. And then I'll come back and hopefully we'll have some questions. Vehicles, 
and artificial intelligence. Working in partnership with the U.S. Department of Defense, the park will provide a strong platform for technology transfer to increase rapid development of new innovations. This partnership will support the military mission and help to achieve the sustainability goals and mandates while also expanding opportunities for research-driven technology startups, academic institutions, and other partners in the region. This research focus will foster a collaborative partnership between industry, government, and universities, and expand and improve technological innovations. The Escambia Midtown Commerce Campus will be anchored by National Energy USA and will serve as its North American headquarters. Here is where you can find out more about this exciting project. So, so the tagline here with, you know, think big and work collaboratively and, and build sustainably, and, you know, the, the project itself, the, we call it EMC squared, which is obviously Einstein's theory of relativity. This is what happens when you put a scientist in charge of marketing. But the idea is to, to build an ecosystem for, you know, innovative companies in what we call the RDT and E space, the research, development, test, and evaluation. So I'm leveraging my relationships with the Department of Defense which is the largest user of energy. And hopefully, a lot of the people in this room that might have an interest in this, but um, I'm more interested to get some feedback. Than, and uh, do I turn it over for questions? Are we moderating questions? Yeah, this is a question. Yes, ma'am. What is your timeline for completing each phase? I saw three in that map. So, it's a great question. <laughs> Here, here's what's happening. I, I call this, uh, national energy is, is in what I refer to as this Uber moment. When Uber first came on, nobody wanted them, except for the end user. The end user was excited. But there was a traditional you know, taxi cab model that was in place, entrenched for decades. And here comes Uber disrupting this entire market through innovation and efficiencies and modernization. And there was resistance to Uber. There were lawsuits. There were all kinds of things. And then right on the heels was Airbnb, again, disrupting a very entrenched market. We come in and we're in this Uber moment because what happens is communities like ours and like all over the country, in my opinion, as a scientist, are profiting off of pollution. They take garbage, they collect it, they put it in a hole, they let our kids worry about it, and they make money in that process. So we come in and we're going to disrupt this whole market. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of resistance because people are like, well, hang on a minute, you know, you're, you're dipping in, my, in my, my wallet. So right now our challenge as an anchor tenant is to be able to secure the garbage. And you would think that would be easy, right? Let me have your garbage. But it's, it's actually pretty, pretty challenging. From a development perspective, our, our development partners, a company called Parkside Partners out of Atlanta, we're, we're not developers. We got enough stuff to do. Um, they anticipate a five to 10 year build out of that park. But it depends on a couple of different things. You gotta get rail access and different things like that. But they envision about a 10 year build out. So obviously market forces, you know, all kinds of things that are out of their control and what the economy does and all this other stuff. But I think we got a lot of good things going here in terms of, a, of development. I, you know, I, I give talks like this all over the place and people are like, you're from where? And Pensacola, what? And so I just refer to us as Silicon Bayou, you know? <laughs> because that model started with the Navy, with a small company called Hewlett Packard, with a university, which at the time before Stanford became Stanford University. So here we're trying to pull in all these pieces and see, and see what happens. So you gotta think big, right? Yes, sir. Not a serious question, but in your video, were those reindeer in the pond? <laughs> <laughs> or, or is it the coffee? I think, I think that might be the coffee. Yeah. I think you had your share of a million cups. <laughs> What's that? It was a grow room. Yeah. What they grow, I don't know. That's not, that's not my bailiwick. Yes, ma'am. Hi there. Actually, a couple questions. Who are your competitors in the recyclable energy field? And, um, well, actually, let's go with that. Okay. 
My biggest competitor is the landfill, first and foremost, because again, we're disrupting this model and landfill managers are kind of like, well, hang on a minute here. You know, this is cool, I like what you're doing, but you're also impacting my budget. So that's our biggest competitor. Our second biggest competitor, uh, there are other companies that will take garbage and they will burn it and produce electricity, which is not what we do, just to be clear. Um, as bad as I think landfills are for the environment, I actually think incinerators are worse. Incinerators are just a lazy reaction. Yeah, you know, recycling is hard. Yeah, you know, waste minimization is hard. Just stick it in the furnace and we'll just burn it. So that, those are our two competitors. So we come in to basically <laughs> disrupt that market and just, you know, turn it on its head. So yes, ma'am. So two good questions. So maybe, maybe I rushed a little bit. So this is our end product. It's an engineered fuel. It's been designated as an engineered fuel. I'll pass this around. This is uh, what makes this fuel different is it is in fact a solid fuel. You don't smoke it. It is a solid fuel. The EPA has designated it as a non-hazardous secondary material. That allows somebody to buy it and put it in a closed coupled gasifier a stoker boiler like we have here at the Chris plant in Gulf Power. So we have two models. We have in Canada, we have three because they have a carbon credit model. Uh, we have one model where we have a revenue coming in. Somebody is paying us a tip fee to process waste. We, uh, we have an all in cost of about $32 per ton, which doesn't include um, debt service. Uh, the tip fee at the local landfill is $45. So in this model, we could obviously offer a discount to, the, to the, feed, the feedstock provider. And then the second line in our business model is we sell this fuel. So this fuel, according to the Southern Research Institute, who tests for all the major power plants in the southeast, uh, should generate about $66 per ton because it's indexed back to the calorific value of the fuel. So we're selling it at $50. So, our model has enough fluctuation in there for any dips in, in the market, with, which, with, 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 which may happen, frankly. Yes, ma'am. How long does it take from the time you receive the trash to the time that you have the product? Oh, this is, these are great questions. So from, from the point that the garbage enters into the tip floor to the time it goes through the process and we actually produce the engineered fuel is 22 minutes. And the majority of that time, the garbage is sitting inside of a vessel under high temperature and steam so that we can cook the waste. So we, what we're trying to do is we're trying to eliminate the pathogens that are in the, the chicken you threw out last night or the bandages that you threw out last night. There's pathogens in that material. So we're cooking the waste inside of a vessel. So about 22 minutes is the residence time. Yes, sir. So China is the bottom line. China uh, has a growing economy. They're more environmentally aware. All of our garbage that we, were, we thought we were recycling was going in an incinerator in China to produce electricity to meet the global demand for, for energy in that country. So the way it disrupts our market, there's now more garbage going into the landfill, which now if you had a capacity for your landfill that reached capacity at 2030, now it's like 2022. So now you're like scrambling if you're a landfill manager and you're opening up another cell, you know, because you don't have a choice. Um, the recycling market actually uh, benefits us. It used to be that a ton of cardboard, uh, what we call OCC, would generate in the marketplace about $80 per ton. Today, that same material, landfill managers have to pay to get rid of it. It's literally going from Pensacola all the way to the West Coast and then it's stacking up at ports in, in Seattle and, and uh, in that area. So it helps us because we can take that material because otherwise it's going into the landfill. So just to be clear, if you have two bins at your house, we're, talk we're talking with the one that's going to the landfill. So we don't disrupt this model. That, that material is still going to the traditional market. Yes, sir. Um, so it's all automatic. 
So this is a safer work environment. 